Welcome back, everybody. If you want to take a seat, we're about to get started. When we were thinking about this event, the, uh, the thing I was excited about was uh, all of the stuff that we just saw. I mean, I thought that those stories about uh, the history of cognitive science and design and uh, Don's adventures around the world are amazing. And I knew many of those, uh, although not all of them. Uh, and so it's been awesome. And so when I was thinking about this event, I thought we could do like a whole lot of that. And uh, I, you know, we ran this idea by Don, and Don's just like, it's all about the future, man. We gotta be, we gotta be forward looking. And so what we wanted to do a little bit right now was I wanted to share with all of you some of the current directions that, that we're thinking about in the, in the design lab. And because we want to get a chance to get to a, a reception in relatively short order, we only picked a, a very small sample of what we could have shared today. But I, I think it, it, it does a, a good job of sketching a little bit of the gamut. And so I'm going to introduce uh, our five speakers, just as Jim did. And um, what we're tr going to try to do is to keep our talks a little bit short so that we'll have a little bit of time for, uh, for panel discussion. And so we'll, we'll see how that shakes out. Um, I think what you're going to see here is that um, the... Goal, I mean, the thing that I think makes the Design Lab unique in a, in a lot of ways, especially on this campus, is that um, often the, the worlds of research, the worlds of education, and the worlds of community are in totally different parts of the campus and have nothing to do with each other. And in this panel, you're going to hear from folks working on the research, folks working on the, the education, and, uh, and folks working on the community. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about UC San Diego and, and about what Don has brought to this perspective is that often when we think about uh, computer interfaces, you think about something that's just the bits. Uh, sometimes when people think about cognition, albeit not here, we think about a, a brain in the vat. And you know what Ed talked about of cognition being uh, embodied in physical and social settings is really at the core of what the design lab is working on. You know, Ed talks about culture is creating cognitive grooves uh, that make certain kinds of thoughts and activities and endeavors easier. And, uh, and so you're going to see the first draft of some of the grooves that we're laying down in the lab here. Um, I love that sentence, uh, you should hang out in the LNR lab. We heard that from several different people. And, and that was one, I've been taking notes from these different talks. And that was one thing that I heard where I'm like, okay, we succeed if all the next, you know, Jeff Elmans and, and Ed Hutchins uh, and Liz Gerbers of the world get the, you should hang out in the design lab. And I, I think we're actually, you know, well on our, we're well on our way. Uh, we're the, we're the next generation of misfits. So thank you to Larry and Ramesh and everybody else who, uh, who makes that possible. Larry, actually, when we started the lab, he was in the space that's now the design lab. And Larry gave us his space so that we could incubate right on the first floor, right where everybody comes in, right at that, that really energetic and open and uh, really great. It's, it's been awesome, so thank you, Larry. OK, so we have people from all different parts of campus, uh, which, which I think is wonderful. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Eli Arnoff Spencer. And Eli is in the medical school. Uh, his, uh, he's got this really mundane history where, um, you know, he's, he's a medical doctor. He often, when we have meetings, he'll have to duck out for rounds. And um, before coming to UC San Diego, he spent a fair amount of time uh, working in South Africa and uh, in Southern Africa in, in general. He's done a lot of public health work. And... Uh, when we started the lab, um, we came up to the second floor to because uh, we heard about what Eli was doing. And so we, we walk in, and Eli shows us the, uh, the kid print project that he was working on. And we look in Eli's office, and there's one book on the shelf, you know, because he just moved in there. And that book was, uh, was one. It was the invisible computer, right? 
it was the yeah it was the invisible computer uh, by Don and so Don autographed his book and Eli Eli joined us in the design lab and things have been off and running since. Uh, Lily Arani is a faculty member in communication who just uh, put her book to press. So let's applaud Lily. That's a, a monumental task. Uh, Lily's got a really interesting background. She was an undergraduate at Stanford. She worked at Google for a time. And so she really understands, by virtue of having done it, uh, what the world of software engineering and technology is, is like. Uh, she went on to get her PhD at UC Irvine, working with Paul Durish. And Lily did this really amazing work uh, looking at how enabling crowdsourced work to give greater control to the workers who are doing it. It's a project that she did uh, in collaboration with others called Turk Opticon. Uh, her book actually is about uh, the, the role of design and the context of design in India. It's super interesting, it's really cool. And so you'll get to hear some of the things that Lily is thinking about. Uh, Lily and I are also running the Design at Large seminar this spring where we're looking at the role of algorithms and ethics in design. And it's been amazing, it's been awesome. Uh, Albert Lin uh, it has been at UC San Diego for a, a good while now. Uh, he's our lifer. Uh, he's got his undergraduate, master's, and PhD uh, from uh, the School of Engineering at UCSD. And um, Albert has a ton of stories of his time at UC San Diego, uh, some of which I can't tell from this podium, but they're, uh, uh, they're, there's, some fun, there's some fun adventures in there. And... Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about Albert's work is that uh, he got his PhD in very straight ahead engineering stuff. And then at the end of it all, he's like, you know, I wonder, um, I've, I've, had a bu I've got a bunch of other questions and his advisor encouraged him to, to pursue those. And so he gathered together a group of people to uh, use crowdsourcing to look for the tomb of Genghis Khan. And so they used satellite photos. Uh, crowdsourced these photographs, satellite photographs of Mongolia, identified about 900 sites that were of potential historical interest. And then Albert went around, as you can see from the banner just outside the building here, uh, by van and by horseback around Mongolia to check a number of these, uh, these sites out, which is, it's, I mean, it's really amazing. Uh, and he's going to tell you about, uh, about some of his current projects, so I won't share more than that now. Um, Michael Meyer is on the faculty of radio. We're really luckily, lucky to be able to recruit him here from the Bay Area. Uh, Michael is one of those strange folks that has this experience in the real world that, uh, that, that Don's also experienced. Uh, Michael's run a number of uh, successful design consultancies. Uh, he was the CEO of Adaptive Path, a uh, really world-leading consultancy. Uh, he ran a group at IDEO. Uh, he's done a lot of design consultancy work on, on his own. Uh, and now he's been teaching uh, design and entrepreneurship and, and Rady and thinking about the future educational opportunities in the, uh, in the, for, for design here. Uh, and lastly, Michelle Morris, uh, we also were really lucky to be able to bring down here. Michelle uh, was an MBA at Stanford and who spent some time at the D School prior to coming down here. And also, uh, she previously was in the, the Secret Service before coming down here. And so if you're ever thinking about you know, crossing Michelle, I highly recommend against it. Uh, you know, uh, she knows things about you that you don't know. And uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, it's big, so really, I mean, the, the diverse backgrounds that Eli, Lily, Albert, Michael, and Michelle have, I think is super, super interesting. And so that we have a little bit of time for a panel, I'm going to uh, hand the floor over to Eli. Thanks, Scott. Hi, Don. Where's Don? Okay, so Russian trolls hacked Scott's email and told me it was a roast. <laughs> <laughs> they told me it wasn't a roast when I got here. And I can't change my mind. So I think I'm going to talk a little bit about Don and then to be nice to Scott, I'll tell you why Don's book was in my office. So, Scott's story is not really correct, and that's a good place to start. My story with Don. Um, it, was, it was before Kid Print. It was before the lab had started. And I think maybe Scott was there. I didn't really remember. 
to be honest. Were you really there? I remember Peter Preuss was there with Don, and I remember there were people who were going to found the, Don, the design lab, so <laughs> I'm sorry, I guess you were there. <laughs> I don't remember. But Don was definitely there, and he was wearing his hat. How many people here are wearing a hat like I'm wearing today? Just Don. So uh, I don't think anybody introduced me to Don. Don just stared at me, and I could tell the look on his face was, why is there somebody wearing my hat? <laughs> and I was thinking, OK, so I've been called Dr. Evil before. And it's really not because of my hair. It's because of my attitude. And <laughs> how many people here know what I'm talking about when I say Dr. Evil? OK. Does anybody remember who used to hang out with Dr. Evil? Maybe he was cloned and related to Dr. Evil. He was like Dr. Evil, only one eighth, one eighth his size. Who got it right? Good students. <laughs> so I guess we had to be friends. Uh, and I had to end up having uh, a new mentor in my life. Because if you're sitting there wearing a hat like that and you're Don Norman, I mean, I, I'm lucky to, to know you, Don. But I, I have a couple more things, just a little bit. So everybody here, we really have talked a bit about scholarship, and I think people are proud of the schools they went to. And if you went to a good school, you talked about it. If you didn't go to a good school, you didn't talk about it. Um, Don has been to all the good schools, like maybe literally all of them. And I think he learned something, and he wrote books about them too. And he's now, what are you, Don, professor of the highest class emeritus. You've been fired by um, Steve Jobs. You've, um, I think, had a successful consultancy. Um, and we were thinking about what the next level is after um, professor, right? And so given the hat, Captain Don is what, and I, 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 I want to be clear, this is Don's idea. We all have to call him Captain Don now. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm honestly, and I don't need to say it because everybody else said amazing things. Don, we're really lucky to have you and have you in our lives. Now I'm going to talk about me. <laughs> so the reason that book was in my office I'm from another field. We don't know about Don Norman. Um, after graduate school, so sorry, I'm, I know I'm a doctor. I went to grad school, too. I have to say that. I was not doing what I was planning to do. I was trying to do graduate school and medical school and something meaningful together, which is nearly impossible. And I went to Africa, and I had the opportunity to go there for about a year and a half, maybe two years, and I lived there. And I was really excited, and I showed up. <laughs> to a place in the north of South Africa, and there was a body <laughs> being brought into my hospital at the same time as me in a truck that said KwaZulu-Natal Health Services, which was, turns out later, that was supposed to be my truck. That was the one I was going to use. And it had a, had a bullet hole in it. <laughs> so they shot a doctor. And they got there, and they were telling me the story. And they said, oh, by the way, welcome to South Africa. And they said that the difference between a living white guy and a dead one in this village is a gun and a, a car, a full tank of gas, and a cell phone. And this was 2006. So that was a little interesting, nerve-wracking, scary. And it turned out the cell phone was used um, because we had an internet of people around the country already. And we could reach out to each other for just about anything you could ever want. 
from medical advice from people who worked in the hospital before to um, helicopters to get out of town when you were in trouble. That's not a joke. Um, to helicopters for your patients. We could take a patient from the bush to Durban in about 30 minutes. That was South Africa in 2006. So I met somebody in my interaction there who um, was in Malawi at the time, and he was setting up the antiretroviral therapy, the AIDS therapy for the country of Malawi, kind of because nobody else would do it. And he was an engineer, and he wasn't a doctor, and he wasn't working with the CDC because he didn't like them because you spent all your money on them, on monitoring. And so he designed the healthcare system of Malawi around HIV, and he used a book. Anybody guess what the book is? The Invisible Computer. And so I got, he told me about this, and he, that's how I know about Don. But he told me something else that was important. He said, look, you can't design to show off. You can't design to show off your technology. You can't design because you have a neat, shiny object. We had open source. We had, we didn't quite have Android yet, but we had touch screens. He said, you have to design so you solve real people's problems. And I took that away from that book and from that conversation, and then I met Don. And I asked him, I said, Don, what do you think about all this? And he said, that's it. That's the point is, why are we doing this? What is the intention of your action and your design? So I think that is what segues us to the future of design, the future of healthcare, maybe the future of what we do. Um, we need to be really, really intentional, and we need to have some rules on why and how we do things as designers, as healthcare designers, as people in our lives, how we interact with our friends, our enemies, our, <laughs> um, <laughs> our, our temporary enemies, Don. Did I mention he stole my hat? <laughs> so I think when, when we're, this is a room full of doers, of people who do amazing things, like, wow, at almost, I think anybody in this room could give this talk or give a talk that was better than this. So what are we going to do? So. I want to flip the switch on two things. One, turn on the lights. Don't have one person in your world, in your life, in your mind that has all the lights on. Like there's no God that's going to save us. There's no one magic person on this planet who's going to be right. It's going to be all of us. And it's going to be how we design for the planet, for the people who really need it. And we stop thinking about us helping other people and us giving stuff to the people who don't have it. Let's think about how we design for us together as a planet. All of us, one planet, seven billion people, no more experts, no more professors, just <laughs> Captain Don. So I'm done. Okay, um, hi, thank you for being here today. And um, as a follow up, I mean, that was a really interesting talk to follow up on because. <laughs> I'm so sorry, no, honestly, I mean, the stories that I was, I was going to talk about something that sounds really big um, because I knew that it wasn't just academics in the room, which is, you know, how do we democratize the future of work? But that can mean a million, million things and the differences in the kinds of things that it means matters, but I only have eight minutes. Um, but the work that I'm going to present to you, I hope Eli will find that it was done in the same spirit that he was talking about. Of, um, I'm going to tell you about the first project I'm going to tell you, the one that Scott mentioned, Tercopticon, is a project that I did, um, and I didn't even think it was research, and I didn't publish on it for three years. I just did it because it was a thing that... Uh, other people were saying that they needed, and it was a skill set I happened to have. So um, to set the context, um, I want to talk a little bit about all of what we're hearing about the way work is changing. Are we going to have jobs? Are robots going to take all of our jobs? Are all the forms of work that we do to keep each other alive, nursing, teaching, is it all going to turn into a gigantic Uber platform? <laughs> um, and there's 
couple of challenges to the public conversation about the future of work right now. One is that we're told it's, a, it's, it's about technological change. And well, we can't really do anything about technological change. It seems autonomous. But technologies are designed by people, some of whom are in this room, some of them are in companies. And I would like to get um, people who are, don't get to be in the rooms of companies to also have a stronger voice in controlling the forms of technologies that they're working for. Um, the other, <clears throat> so that's what I mean when I talk about bringing democracy to design of the future of work. It's partially about understanding technology is not as something that's autonomous. The other challenge with um, a lot of the future of work debates right now is that we have really centralized platforms. We have Uber, we have Lyft, we have systems, uh, systems that Amazon runs, um, and there's thousands of systems that we don't know about where people work from their homes, work from their cars, doing fragmentary bits of work. Um, but there's four big companies, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, that have a lot of power to shape the ecosystem, to choose, invest in startups, and to shape the public conversation about what kind of work we'd like to be doing in the future, with whom, um, and what voice we have in there. So um, I'm going to zoom into one specific uh, system that I've been um, kind of hanging out in with workers uh, since 2008. Uh, and that system is called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk is a place where programmers go when they don't know how to make the AI for something work, <laughs> or when they need help training the data that makes the AI for something work. So if you wanted to make a magical app on your smartphone, if you're a programmer, if you want to make a magical app where you could take a picture of a bookshelf and then have that bookshelf magically turn into a list of books, or you want to record a talk and then have that talk magically turn into a transcript, there's a lot of artificial intelligence that can kind of get you part of the way there. Um, and then there's always this gap of the kinds of stuff that the AI is like really not sure how to classify. And um, there are people who work out of their homes who do uh, who get those data inputs and are really good at pattern matching, really good at looking at images, really good and skilled at hearing sounds and separating them into culturally meaningful words. And so those people will help close that AI gap on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, but one of the issues is that they are essential to the future of technology, but they're treated as independent contractors. Um, the most recent studies by Je Jeff Bigham and others have shown that they make median $2 an hour in this ecosystem. Um, and the ecosystem, the Amazon Mechanical Turk system is treated as something that offers workers a lot of flexibility to choose when they work, how they work, and to choose who they want to work for so they could just ignore tasks that are, don't pay enough. But when you're a worker trying to make ends meet to pay the rent, um, you don't actually have a choice. You have the flexibility to, to work 12 hours a day to try to gather enough money. So. Um, the way Amazon designed the platform was pretty asymmetrical. Um, workers would, when an employer wanted to hire workers, they could see what percentage of other employers' work um, has been marked as bad work by, you know, from this worker. So like this worker's had 80% of their work marked as good work. I will let them work for me. Um, so w employers had information on workers' reliability, but workers didn't have any information on employers' reliability. Um, when I was basically like I sent out a survey to mechanical Turk workers my second year of grad school and I was just asking them hey a lot of people are saying a lot of things about this platform what do you like about this form of work what don't you like about this form of work and people had really diverse answers but one of the things that they agreed on was we don't know how to we don't have a good way of sharing information to avoid employers who don't pay the wages or don't communicate when there's a problem in like the design of the work um, so we didn't try to solve the problem of the future of work, but we just made this system that lets workers submit reviews of the employers they've worked for to share information with others. Um, this is just one piece of an innovation ecosystem in which the workers, these $2 an hour workers, are actually running forums. They're talking, they have their own kind of water cooler cultures online where they teach people how to be a good Turk worker, how to work through the system efficiently. Some of the workers in these systems actually have scripting and programming skills and build tools to complete the tasks better. Um, so this isn't about designers coming in from a university and revolutionizing with their skills and vision, but rather 
designers coming in and asking, hey, uh, I think what's going on in this work economy is not fair. What would you think is fair and how can we help? Um, and maybe that's an example of then me thinking of myself as a former tech worker working at Google, working in software companies saying, well, we're all, you know, Turk workers and software programmers, we're all working for this industry. We all need to think about how to make it more um, democratic. So I do agree with Eli that we should be thinking about how we design with other people for the planet that we share, for fates that we share. Um, so uh, Turkopticon was a system that did get picked up by a lot of workers. Like we had 20,000 active users um, for many years sharing information with each other, engaging in mutual aid. Um, but it was really structured information, you know, one, rate this employer one through five on their fairness, communicativity, the quality of pay. Um, and we wanted to see how else we could contribute the kind of coding and design skills that we happen to have as a team. So working with Nilufar Salehi, who just is about to finish her PhD at Stanford, Michael Bernstein at Stanford, and a team of students, um, we started asking Turk workers, hey, you have these forums where you talk to each other. Um, what are the things that end up preventing you from, being, uh, from coming together to express changes you'd like to see in the organization of work, either on the Amazon platform or for particular employers? And the workers we talked to said, well, you know, I, this forum's really important to me, the community is crucial, but I'm afraid that if I say, hey, this employer doesn't pay enough, um, someone else might like the employer, and there might be drama, or they might be angry at me, and I might not even know because we're all talking to each other on the internet. Might even get kicked off the forum. So we ended up building a, a, for, a so social computing system called Dynamo, where we let workers from across all these different forums talk to each other anonymously. Um, we also wanted to lower the barrier to participation for workers who were coming in, so we had a section where people could submit ideas for issues that they'd like to work on together, and people could participate just by upvoting or downvoting. Um, and we made sure that the people coming into the system were actually workers. We authenticated them so they could speak without, being, uh, without fear of retribution from employers or Amazon. So... The, these are just two examples of a kind of so social computing design that's come from an attitude of not s knowing and imagining a future that you'd like to bring to people, but going to people and asking, what is it that the future, that the future makers in Silicon Valley have not imagined that's actually a concrete need that's happening here, and how can we work together to plug those gaps? And, um, but tools can only go so far. So where I'm headed next is, you know, I was talking to a group of workers who run these forums where workers talk to each other. They're organizers and leaders in their own communities. Um, but what they uh, want help with from me as a kind of academic ethnographer designer is mediating between them because they don't usually talk to each other, but they're building tools and sometimes they're sharing data um, and they want my help figuring out um, how can they better share data with each other? How can they better have diplomacy amongst themselves to enable them to engage in some kind of collective action to get resources to help, the, to help workers sustain all these tools and forums that they are already innovating, but they're doing on a volunteer basis while making $2 an hour. So I'm really excited about the future of the design lab and being able to think with, all, with the diverse interdisciplinary communities that it brings together. Um, I see for my work that I need to be talking to people who not only understand cognitive science, organization, and communication, my department, but also political theory and governance. Um, there's a lot we can learn from histories of development abroad, again, which Eli has experience with. And I'm asking, can a worker-centered computing be something that helps democratize the future of work? So with that, thank you so much for the chance to speak and share these ideas with you. All right. Uh, yeah, so keeping on with the theme, there's got to be a little roast and then some talk about some other things. Uh, right, yes. yeah. But um, actually, I don't. I don't have any any negative anything negative to say about Don, other than the fact that I I, uh, I did have to hang a, a like a, a really interesting heavy painting at his house once, and that was uh, that was one of the more daunting experiences of my life because there was a battle over which screwdriver to use. But you know, it was like I mean, it was horrible. The other thing I was going to say is, uh, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, exactly. 
you know, I first met with the team, I think when, when there was talk about starting up the lab. And so, you know, I got a really incredible chance to have these, these intimate conversations with Don about all sorts of different things. And the one thing I learned was that the approach he was taking to design was not, was not just for technology. It was just about, you know, really anything that you might do in life, the way you might live life. Uh, so, you know, I, the last couple of years has been pretty intense for me. I had, uh, I had this really intense divorce I was going through when, when I first met Don. And I remember just sitting down with him for a coffee just to talk about how to approach that from a design perspective. Uh, yeah. and, and, and it was true. I mean, like the minute I looked at it objectively and we started talking about the, you know, the, what, the, what the actual problems were, it wasn't about this, it was about that, da, da, da. Then, you know, then I was able to map out a really healthy relationship with my ex uh, and, you know, the mother of my kids and everything else like that. So there was a design element to how I looked at, you know, everything in life, my challenges and, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, and then, and then the next big challenge of my life came when the design lab was up in full swing, and that was when I, I found myself in the hospital bed with this crazy, you know, crushed ankle. Uh, and so, I'm breaking with the tradition. I'm using the slides now because I, I made slides. I'm going to use the slides. Uh, <laughs> but Don and and Ed and others uh, and Ramesh, they they showed up at my hospital bed and we started talking about. And Scott and we talk, and, we, and Jim, and we started talking about like uh, you know what we looked started looking at it like a design challenge actually. It was you know how do you make the technology so that you don't have to worry about you know your you know your limb getting wet in the ocean because you like surfing and everything else like that. If you end up getting an amputation, uh, and so I ended up being able to look at it again like I looked at my divorce and map out a really good life as what would result in the amputation of my right leg. Which, uh, you know, I don't have the socks. I wish I had the socks, but I can show yeah, I don't even have socks, but I have, I have, a, I have a robotic leg. <laughs> uh, a Captain Don leg, we can call it that. Uh, I'm a pirate. I'm a pirate. I just realized. Yeah, pirate. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. So uh, I <laughs> it's so much more appropriate. Okay. And then the next thing uh, happened was I got up, I got standing, and I started using that idea of looking at what had happened to me as a design opportunity because the one thing Don always teaches is you really got to study something uh, enough to, to know the, what your problem is. You don't even know what problem you're trying to solve for. And I had this super deep end of one experience where I'm like, okay, I've got this limb. It took, and I built a limb, but it took me months. It cost me a lot of money, and you had to get the shape just right. Uh, and I had other things I was dealing with, like phantom limb pain, and we were able to get through that with a, with a combination of uh, working with Ramachandran uh, to use mirror therapy and combining that with all sorts of different modalities to get into flow states, everything ranging from meditation to psychedelics and like to try to get my brain to remap. Uh, and then the next thing you know, it's like, okay, well, how do you then go and, and use a design approach to get through, you know, to, to, to look at all this stuff? So at the time, I had been doing a lot of work in Guatemala um, right prior to that, uh, where we were mapping the inside of caves uh, using you know, these Mayan temples, using Xbox Connects or whatever we could find. And we had this approach where we used a bunch of cameras, uh, and we took a bunch of different angles of any given object, uh, a bunch of photographs, and we were, we were able to layer over those different uh, photographs to make 3D models of the, of the object. It's something called a a a photogrammetry. And, you know, was being developed in the field of computer science. What I realize now is that you know my process of building a leg is a is a is a design challenge because everybody's legs are different. And even you know where you're where it attaches to your body, it's a unique challenge where everybody's completely different and it has to fit exactly right, uh, and it's got to be incredibly robust to be able to be usable. If it doesn't fit right, like within a millimeter, uh, it's it's a paperweight. And the crazy thing is, is that for me, I have access to the person who can sculpt it. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, there's 40 million amputees in the world, of which few of them will ever be able to afford spending time with a doctor for months to map their legs uh, and, and then cast them. So we looked at this and we thought about it a little more. I talked to Don for a while. I talked to Eli. We, we came up with an idea. Uh, and it was combining uh, the, the sort of same technique that we're using in archaeology to map an artifact. And now my artifact is my limb, the remaining part of my limb. And then if we can combine that with a 3D printing model or some kind of distributed production, uh, then essentially what you have is a disruption to how people receive limbs. 
Right now, you've got a couple of people who can access a doctor, and that doctor spends months upon months trying and trying again to shape a limb using plaster of Paris, uh, and then and then you know and then casting and casting and casting until you finally get what I have. Uh, but it, you have to be there. So for the 40 million amputees in the world, which actually the number is spiking now uh, because of diabetes, uh, there is there's just no access. So you you end up losing your ability to function. Whereas if we try something different, if, you know, if we try a different approach, all of a sudden the doctor is in everybody's phone because your phone has a camera and you can send information. Uh, and so uh, this is also having just come off the back of collaborating with Eli and a bunch of different projects. And it's like, okay, well, there's got to be completely new ways of thinking through how we access the, the, you know, our, the care that we get. But also, like, it's basically teleportation now, right? So, like, the future of medicine might be this, this sort of teleportation of our bodies into these distributed production models. The other thing that quickly happened uh, is I got really into figuring out how to get through this phantom limb pain. Uh, it's, it's something where you feel such excruciating pain in a part of your body that doesn't exist anymore. So how do you feed it with opioids? You just can't. You can't take care of it in any other kind of modality other than thinking about how to get through the, the remapping of your mind. So using the same uh, you know, kind of spirit of problem solving and, and actually identifying what the problem was, uh, you know, I started thinking about how to remap my brain. And I had the honor of working with folks like Vyas Ramachandran and then Ramesh Rao, who took me out to a, a Kundalini yoga session. Uh, and, and, and when we started talking about it, he said, you know, Kundalini is in, in ancient Sanskrit described as a technology uh, to remap mind to body. And that really struck me. Uh, and, and then we started co having deeper conversations about what that really meant. Like, is it just about belief? Maybe it's about belief. And if it is about belief, then, you know, the whole idea of placebo should be completely looked at in a different way. Like, placebo might be the most underutilized concept that we've had access to, you know? Uh, so, you know, this is a picture of me really loving my leg at Burning Man. I'm feeling it. I'm, like, dancing. I'm having a great time. I got rid of my pain. And I'm in a flow state. Uh, what... What I mean by flow state is that all those different things like Kundalini Yoga or breathing meditations or, or, or the stuff that I was doing with, um, you know, combining uh, psychedelics with these mirror therapies, it was about getting the brain to a place where you could actually remap it and it would hold on to some other thing. So what we're doing now is we're trying to do things like combining uh, music with EEG sensors and heart rate variability to create dynamic visualizations that can then go and layer on top of you a visual of what your brain's doing to try to pull you further into these states of total immersion. I find that for me, music is a place where I reach flow states. Uh, and the, ne the next thing is like, okay, well, if I'm jamming with a bunch of people and I'm really into it, there's maybe half an hour of a jam session where it, maybe for a minute you feel like you're actually really hit it, you know, you really got there. So the idea of like a group flow. Uh, so now what we're doing is we're combining things like heart rate variability monitors that Ramesh developed uh, for the Bliss Buzzer project with visualizations that we can then create around uh, our shared experience. And, and then these are two people with accelerometers and the data is actually being driven by uh, sensors on their bodies that are telling them something about their state of being from the parasympathetic nervous system to their, to their brain waves. And then we're going to try to apply all of these things to all the different technologies that cultures have developed over centuries and over the human experience to get into these states where our brains are free enough because we're so immersed in it to remap to new realities. Now, I'm done talking because I, I used up my eight minutes, uh, but the, my career has been led by, by curiosity and a desire to go to awesome places. So this is like, you know, okay, awesome places. But then when I met Don, uh, you know, I had the honor of collaborating with him in, the, in you know, the sort of early ideas around the lab and the rest of the team, uh, I realized that, you know, literally every single challenge in my life can be looked at as a design challenge. Uh, and you can take it from the same sort of, because I'm a human, so I'm human-centered. Like, like, I'm the challenge, like I'm a challenged person. Uh, <laughs> but those challenges, they can take you to some incredible places where you can tap into the very essence of the human condition. Uh, and I think that's what the spirit of design really is. Okay, thank you very much. I had planned. <laughs> I, had, I had planned. Can you hear me back there? If I if I stand out here and speak in my professor voice, can you hear me in the background?
you can't see me. Oh, okay. Turn on the light. <clears throat> so I was, I was, I was going to thank you. I was going to uh, not not make any slides for today, um, and then some questions. Oh, even better. So I was, I was going to not use any slides for today, and then I realized that I actually had the perfect image to encapsulate the standard that we need to rise to if we're going to carry forward the vision of what Don has begun here. And um, it will, it, it'll, it, it's no surprise to any of us here who know Don well that he makes himself incredibly freely available to students. Uh, spends a lot of time with students, will talk with any student about any relevant topic. And as a result, the students have gotten to really get to know him very, very well. Not just his work, but Don as a person. They have come to notice uh, and appreciate all of the little signature elements of style that Don has. For instance, his hat. And other things. And so it was, it was really interesting to me that at the end of, uh, of uh, the last session of Design 1, last class of Design 1, last quarter, uh, my team of TAs, I have a very large team of TAs and, and undergraduate uh, IAs um, who, who really are the people who teach the course, the fundamentals of, of design, they had a very specific image of how they wanted to remember their quarter of, as they put it, channeling their inner Don Norman. So we got together and we took a group photograph. <laughs> and, and I think that this is just a perfect illustration of uh, the kind of total immersion uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, that we have to, uh, to rise to. Um, as we carry forward the vision of, uh, uh, of what Don has gotten started here. And uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about how we're going to do that, how we have been doing that, how we have done that um, in education specifically. And it can really be summed up in just three ideas and seven words. And I've got a few pictures as well. The first idea and the first two words are undergraduate minor. When we came together as a faculty in the design lab a few years ago and we asked ourselves what could we do that was going to create the greatest benefit for the greatest number of students as quickly as possible, the thing that we came up with was an undergraduate minor because it was something that could be applied to any major that's offered here uh, at UC San Diego and it would be of benefit to any student who wanted to pursue it. Essentially create, uh, crafting for people the, the crossbar of the T-shaped individual who has the deep competence, uh, subject matter expertise that their undergraduate major gives them, and then the crossbar of how to work together with other specialties as part of a design team. The design minor is not quite two years old. And already, already we're fulfilling on that vision of serving the greatest number of students uh, as broadly across the university as possible. We now have 124 uh, declared design minor, uh, declared students declared as uh, with for the design minor, which makes us the 13th most populous minor on campus, only a year and two-thirds in. You can see that we, we span broadly across campus. Unsurprisingly, a lot of social science uh, students, but also people in the biological sciences, um, in arts and humanities, and, and in engineering. And it's a wide range of majors. Our goal, and as we think about, you know, we kind of look across, uh, look across the, uh, the, the quad, over to the, uh, the SME building and the new design and innovation building that's being built right next to it. Uh, and looking at that and, and the floors of classrooms and maker space that are available, and we think, hmm, the biggest major on campus right now is eight, or minor on campus right now is 800 students. I'll bet that we can do even better than that. And so in the next five, 
10, 15 years, however long it takes us uh, to build that out. Our, our vision is to take this broad spectrum of, of students in the design minor and build that out to 1,000 students in the design minor all the way across campus. One idea. The second idea, and the next two words, is executive education. And a new model of executive education, not just sitting uh, a bunch of execs in very expensive seats and handing, uh, holding their hands through a lecture and a case study, but actually going out and learning from companies that are doing interesting things. And this is representative of a really interesting alliance that we've, uh, that we've forged with uh, some companies who know a lot about <coughs> managing a large firm through the, the process of transforming uh, into a design-driven organization. Most people who have ever, has anybody done, ever done uh, an SAP installation? Would you characterize SAP as a, a highly design-sensitive <coughs> company from that experience? Not then, <laughs> not then. <coughs> Surprisingly, uh, I think, I think if, we, if we had to go through that again, that experience, and, I, and I, know I could tell from the flinching that, like most people, you would never go through that experience again willingly, um, you'd find that SAP is actually quite a design-driven company right now. IBM, similarly, has gone through a tremendous transformation. They've been generous enough to allow us uh, access to their company <coughs> to understand how they did that. And we, in turn, are turning around and teaching these lessons to other companies. Companies like Viasat, um, who is working with us as a development partner in the uh, executive education space so that we can go out and help local companies understand how to employ the people that we're graduating from here who are now skilled in design. The third idea and the last three words, is a master's in design. And the vision for this comes from a conversation that, uh, that Don and I were having about a year ago, as the, the minor was approved and well underway, starting to grow. The executive education initiative was, was starting to, to, to gather a little bit, uh, a little bit of traction. And Don, Don just kind of, we were sitting there and he's, and, and he's, he was just like, <sighs> it's not exciting anymore. You need to come up with something exciting. And so we talked and thought for quite a long time, and we came up with the Masters in Design. And I remember pitching the idea to Don, and he looked at that, and he, and, and, and he, he got that, that look on his face and that, whoa, now that's exciting. So a fifth-year fifth Masters. Uh, a master's in design uh, is the third big idea and the last three words. Um, in initial conversations with the people who have recently crafted uh, master's programs here, I think that it's going to be exciting uh, in a lot of other ways, uh, probably most notably the volume of paperwork that's going to be generated. Um, but I think that it's, uh, it's exciting work that's definitely going to be worth it. So the three ideas, the seven words describing how we have been uh, fulfilling the vision that Don has set out for the lab, at least in the education space, how we are continuing to build upon the vision, uh, and what we have waiting in the wings for the next group of us to, uh, to undertake. I might need some help up here. Can I get some help? Mine's on this one. I don't even need. Is that it? Is that what's stopping it? I don't need to. I actually don't need slides, so that's okay, that's okay too. Um, okay, so my name is Michelle Morris. Um, my name is Michelle Morris, and I'm the Associate Director, and it is such an honor to be here with you all today, uh, especially celebrating the, the ongoing legacy, but certainly the force of nature that is Don Norman. 
and the woman sitting beside him, Julie Norman. I always jest with Don. I can tell when, he, when Julie's been away because he's just not quite as cool and quite on point <laughs> as he is when she's not away. So, uh, so <laughs> shout out to you, Julie. Um, when I was thinking about how do I want to talk and share with you a little bit about how we think of the third pillar of the lab, which is community. We have these three pillars, which is our, our the integration of, d of research and education and this community integration in our lab. The image that came to my mind was question mark. Partly because we know from, uh, from either knowing Don or hearing a lot about Don that, you know, what he, one of the biggest pieces of his legacy is asking those questions that get to find the real need at the core of whatever the challenge is. And then really homing in again with those questions to, uh, to get to the, need, to the solutions around those needs. So some of that is just, just um, because everything I think about with the spirit of the design lab is through that, that inquiry. But also, you might have read, and if you haven't, I know there's some free copies around here at Crichton Magazine, but I love this quote that is in this current uh, edition with an article on Don. I'm not distractible, I'm curious, and I am creative. And I think that's really at the heart of what we're doing in the community as well as everything that we're doing in the design lab. Um, when I first started in 2015, Don uh, said, I need you to go forth and find out what is design in San Diego. And whatever that means, just figure it out, explore it, identify it, and come back so that we know what we're doing here uh, and how we might add to, the, to our region. And that quickly turned into, this is actually, uh, as you can see, post-it notes, and the, the phrase at the cross the top will eventually be innovation designed here. But it turned into, what is the discussion around uh, innovation in San Diego? And how does design serve as a driver for that? as well as providing tools and processes and uh, talent around that so that we can build our world rather than just let it happen by default. And then what is the design lab's role in that? Because if you look across all innovation hubs at scale in the world, they always have a university component and that is not by accident. So the culmination of, uh, of this exploration process, and I want to make a couple shout outs here to Joan Greger, to Scott Robinson, to T. Scott Edwards, and to Elena Pacente, who were also really part of this core team. Uh, Don gave us lots of runway and we just ran with it. Uh, turned into what is this movement called Design Forward, and it culminated in a summit, which was really a prototype, another question, which is, is San Diego ready to think about design from a human-centered perspective? And uh, we weren't sure. In the words of Scott Clemmer, who was our MC, he said, I thought maybe 50 people would come, and wow, there were 600 people. And they weren't all designers. In fact, the ratio for that first summit was, uh, uh, over the course of the day, was 60% business, actually, and 40% designers. And we were trying to say, you know, what, what, what is San Diego ready for, and what can our role be? I'm going to just show you, just quickly, so you get, really get a sense of the spirit of Design Forward. Design is not what you probably think it is. Design is not making things pretty. Design is solving the right problem. The world is filled with great problem solvers. Few of them ever step back and say, was that the right problem that I solved? More than ever, I feel like citizens and the community want a voice in what the future of their built environment is and what it becomes. We need to continue to use design thinking to really help drive our economy. If you actually start to tip the organization in thinking about design, all of a sudden you're attracting more people because you see the value and, and, and the spirit of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so when you can motivate people, you know, that you know, making small changes in design here can actually have global impact. bit about what Design Forward was. I'm happy. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment, but it has gone on to be this nonprofit that's uh, very successful under uh, Scott Robertson's leadership. Um, so, 
so we took that, that, the answer to that prototype, and we thought, okay, now when we think about community in the design lab, we're gonna think about it in a couple different ways. One, our design lab community, and starting to find like-minded people, or the misfits, I've heard that word lots of times. I know when Don hired me, he, his exact words were, you're just the kind of misfit that will do well here. So, uh, so you know, that, that's part of our community. But then, our UC San Diego community, there's so much happening just in this building um, and, and, you know, thank you Larry and Ramesh and all the, the researchers here and the, and the staff, um, but also across the campus. And then also then moving out to the businesses, to the civic organizations, to the community groups and the government, and then ultimately global. And not all uh, chronologically, but certainly in parallel. And so, um, I, think, I think I've got the right font, Don, I think it's 24-ish. But uh, when we think about, when we think about community, uh, this is really this is really how the, the wonderful group of people, both inside the lab and, and in the community that I work with, uh, this is really how we think about it. And I'm just going to spend about 30, uh, not even, probably 15 seconds on each slide. Um, you know, there's a huge innovation system on campus, ecosystem, and so making sure that we're involved with the Office of Research Affairs and their Innovation Leaders Council on campus, with extension and the new building that's going on, uh, that's going up downtown, and how that connects with the building. Uh, the design and innovation building going on here on campus. Um, working with Jacobs School of Engineering that has a fantastic corporate affiliate program and that we're very aligned with. Working with urban studies and planning since a lot of what's happening in San Diego is really around urban design. Working with the Contexto Robotics Institute on things like mobility and uh, transportation and certainly all of our other colleagues here in Qualcomm. The alliance, so out of our Design Forward movement, the, this Design Forward alliance was built. It's an alliance of practitioners and business advisors, and uh, we really have taken on this idea of designing tomorrow today. There was another summit again this year. We have our eyes set on the world design capital, not because that's a great title to have, but mostly because the work that's gonna go in, uh, and I'll do a shout out to, to Kurt and David, who I know are a big part of this too, the work that's gonna go into making our region uh, even be able to explain why what's happening here is design-driven innovation and not just ad hoc innovation is going to be really, really exciting. And uh, the Alliance and the Design Lab are a big part of that. Uh, our collaborative is, our, our, again, our corporate affiliates or our strategic partners, working very closely with uh, Michael Meyer and our design Center for Design-Driven Transformation, uh, and also working with uh, not only local design firms but also uh, the Design Academy, for example, who's giving uh, some workshops as well. And thinking about our regional partnerships, why would we do this? Not just because we want to have really cool research to do, but because the, the actual challenges that our region faces, we have a strong voice in. For example, I'm just going to highlight SANDAG. San Diego is one of the top, is the, one of the only 10 proving grounds for autonomous vehicles. We've already heard that there's lots happening in autonomous vehicles on this campus alone. And they have partnered with us and with the Contextual Robotics Institute. And they're saying, hey, we want your input. We've done market research, but we know we're not really connecting for a long-term, sustainable, very future-thinking uh, solutions. And so will you work with us? And that's just a, a, one example of the many things uh, that these partnerships come from. They also feed right into design challenges. This past year, we did Design for San Diego, which I believe uh, EVC Simmons mentioned earlier where we th said, okay, we've got researchers here, and we've got community work here. How do we bridge that gap so you don't have to wait for the rigor of academia, but you don't have to work on the timelines that are usually the real world? There's got to be a way to come together. And then how do we engage people at a deeper and more meaningful, in a deeper, more meaningful way? So uh, I highly recommend if you've never heard of D4SD, check out that website. Uh, we're going to be building on those challenges. We did that with, just again, all those regional partners I just showed you. We did that challenge with them, so certainly not in isolation. And then in addition to the uh, mobility, excuse me, the proving ground that I mentioned, the SANDAG, uh, they're putting up mobility hubs along the trolley line and throughout San Diego. And we have an opportunity to actually design the one here on our campus that is going to connect the two buildings but also maybe help design some of the other ones, getting students involved, getting other departments involved, getting our practitioners from the Design Forward Alliance involved. Very, very exciting. And then the final piece, um, and definitely one of the most important 
our students. Uh, we've got clubs. Yeah, they're fantastic. And they are so much smarter than we could ever be uh, without them. And so we've got these groups like Design for, um, uh, excuse me, Design for America, uh, Liz Gerber. Uh, we know that you are responsible for that being here and for it being global, so thank you, or, or certainly national. And then uh, Design at UCSD is our largest design organization on campus, and we actually have leadership that is in the lab once a week to make sure that we know what is happening with those organizations. <coughs> we are uh, launching a pipeline for PhD students to come in from other organizations. Uh, certainly in conjunction with faculty, but that are interested in coming, they're funded, they want to come here, and they've heard that we're doing things in the real world, and how can they get more exposure to that? And then finally, we do some workshops, uh, again, aligned with Michael Meyer and the education mission, uh, to fill out the co-curriculars, so that we're not just, whoop, is that my two to go? Yeah. Uh, so, all that to say, it's exciting what we're doing with the community, tons of stuff, lots and lots of things. Um, but really what we didn't want to do is come back to this, this real, the spirit of Don Norman, the creative, the curious, and I will also say the, the, the one that pushes. I was at a, a mixer with, with Don downtown last week, and uh, he basically took the microphone from the speaker who was talking about their company. And it all ended in a hug, but what I will say is that he said, why are you telling us about your company? Don't give us a pitch. We know you're great. What are you going to do for our community? How are you going to help us come together? And I will give it to the speaker. She quickly, she changed on a dime. And then the whole group, the whole, uh, the whole group that was gathered for this particular uh, event <coughs> came together in a different way. And that's the power of Don Norman. And that's the power that we're hoping will be channeled through the community and uh, education and research integration. Thank you, Don. I have it. It's very interesting that you bring that up, actually. Uh, so yes, through some of the community groups, and also an opportunity has come our way, uh, actually through Eli, uh, with downtown thinking about homeless uh, amongst the elderly population, which oftentimes is let out, uh, left off of some of the, the political demographic um, statistics. And so yes, in a lot of different ways. But this one, I think, will be uh, a, a, pr a particular interest to the lab because it's got interdisciplinary. The rest are through the community. That's a longer conversation. <laughs> so the question, longer the longer question was, uh, what do you think about the tent? And we'll save that one, we'll for, save the that one for the reception. I would love to talk to you about that. And, uh, and for Eli, with his wonderful hat, you can ask him where he got his hat. Or his socks. Or his, or his, his socks. socks. Eli. Uh, <laughs> Eli, where did you get your socks? Danielle Berkeley gave them to me. Woo! All right. Power socks. <laughs> and uh, is there a question out there for, I guess we don't need to go exactly in order, for, uh, for Lily or Michael or Albert? Uh, yeah, we'll, and we'll go Chuck Pelly first. Chuck Pelly says, everyone in this room should spend one Hi, hour Chuck. with Eli, <laughs> and you'll enter a new level of understanding. The same is true if you try his barbecue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. And the question for Lily is, where is it and how is it that people work for $2 an hour? That's an excellent question. Um, the majority of these workers who are on Amazon Mechanical Turk, of which there are tens of thousands at any given time, are in the United States. 
So a lot of times people make an assumption that, oh, this is people working in other countries. And you know, while I question the idea that people in different places doing the same work are worth different amounts, um, yeah, this is mostly in the United States. And it's because they're independent contractors. So um, a law that was designed to let people like consultants be able to set their upside on their own independent work now gets used by Uber and Lyft and Amazon to um, say that people can consent into getting paid just per task. Okay. <laughs> Dawn in action. We have a mysterious <laughs> we have a mysterious speaker offering a correction. <laughs> Would you like to take my mic or should I just give it? <laughs> what am I missing? Jump in, Don. Come on up. Come on up, Don. <laughs> Woo! In many ways, the uh, this mechanical Turk is an unintended consequence, although it may have been intended. Because what you do is you, you tell people, hey, we have jobs, you can do it anytime you like, and it's, you, all you have to do is look at the picture and give the name. All you have to say whether this is A or B or C. That's all it is. And you get a penny every time you do that. And so that's the point. You, you are not told, we want you to work and we'll pay you $2 an hour. We're told, you can do this anytime you like and you'll get a certain number of cents for doing everything. And when you work it all out, it ends up being $2 an hour. Right. But I, what I will say is that I think in 2005 and six, or 2006, seven, eight, what you said would have been very true. But at this point, Uber, Lyft, and Amazon Mechanical Turk have become such a topic of public conversation that the workers who are coming to that system, they, they know that they're not, they don't know they're going to make $2 an hour. They're hoping a lot of times for $6 an hour. Um, so we got to ask what's happening with employment numbers in America that to be fully working is to have to settle for those kinds of wages too. It's <laughs> going to be an interesting reception. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And that one we're going to say for I want to talk to you. The question <laughs> you was how can that be <laughs> either morally or ethically acceptable at any level? Uh, yeah, towards the back. So the question for Mark Miller, who was an undergraduate with Don, was how do we take all of the principles that we've learned from cognitive science over these past decades with LNR and all of that and bring it to the problem of K-12 education? All right. Well, I'll give you a, a quick answer, which is that one of the projects that we have in the lab looks at active learning. And... Um, uh, it's a research area that I kind of fell into accidentally by trying to teach design online. And one of the things that we're most excited about right now, we work a bit with, uh, with local folks in education. Uh, and I think there's some, you know, you, may, you probably know about some of the cool stuff like uh, High Tech High, which started in, uh, in Point Loma. Um, but one of the things that we're excited about right now, and I think uh, Vineet Pandey, who's right there, is working on, is it's kind of weird to me that right now we divide school from the uh, actual stuff that we're curious about. And, and I'm, not, I'm far from the first person to offer this insight, but it seems weird that we decide on March 4th at 10 a.m. you're going to learn about X, and it would, it would make a lot more sense to learn about it at, uh, uh, when you're curious about it. And, and I say that as somebody who, you know, decades after school, will be like, oh, I'd love to know about X right now. How do I do that? And in particular, one of the things that we're curious about, we do a lot of research uh, on software platforms that help people do creative work and help teach creative work. And we're also looking at how we can build so uh, software platforms to help people ask, their own, ask and answer their own uh, scientific questions. So we all have questions about our health, and we have a, a platform actually that anybody here can try uh, called Gut Instinct that uh, you can log on to and it will help you design uh, and recruit uh, experiments about your, your health. And I think we have, b before 
the two most important things of the day are about to happen, which is the reception, and Don will get a chance to speak. But we have, uh, if we had one more, yeah. Welcome. That. Oh, you said oh, yeah. So the question was, how how do students, broadly uh, across campus, how do how do students learn how to think about I think uh, the economic feasibility or viability uh, of the uh, the solutions that they come up with? You know, what's what's really interesting is that that's actually not explicitly a part of what we're teaching within the design minor. Um, it's really about understanding, uh, it's developing the skills to see and notice and think and create like a designer. And what's really striking is that even though we are, we're actually asking students, don't think so much about the economic viability of what you're coming up with, come up with the great product. This crop of students automatically rolls that in. The final projects that, that we see coming out of Design 1, the foundational design class, students almost always talk a little bit about the economic viability. I think that that has just so much permeated uh, the discussion and the thinking, not just on campus but in society more broadly, that they automatically roll in a certain sensitivity to that. Now, the, the follow-up question is how do we help them think through that more carefully in a more structured fashion. Uh, and I think that the, the larger answer to that is uh, the master's in design, which is why we need to have a master's in design, which would be a truly cross-disciplinary um, uh, master's, one where students would work, uh, would learn by working on projects sponsored by outside companies. And so it would have that edge of real world requirements. Um, but, but it is an interesting phenomenon that even though we're explicitly not focusing on that, the students automatically go there. And well, and if I can add, so, so one thing on the community front, so one of the reasons we integrate with the Office of Innovation and Commercialization uh, is that they, they hold workshops on this very thing. And part of the co-curricula that, uh, curriculum that we're trying to build out for the various students that complements what's currently being taught at the undergraduate level is so that they have these workshops in the business model canvas, in the idea of economic feasibility and viability and how that plays out in how to pitch in how to facilitate some things that they are getting some exposure to, um, but a little more explicitly done by bringing in practitioners, both from the entrepreneur community and the design community, as well as the expertise in, in the lab. So it's happening on the co-curricular side as the, the, uh, the more accredited side is being built out. Question for Albert. Albert, um, if I may extract some career advice from you for the students in the room. You and Don strike me as very similar people. Um, you do many different things. I hope you take that as a compliment. Um, so my curious, my, my question is, you've stayed at UCSD. This is your home. You've been t called the lifer. Don's come and gone. What's the better strategy and why? Um, well, you know, I, I, stayed, I stayed because of a lot of different aspects of... Uh, the surf is really good here, first of all. Like, I mean, it's amazing, right? Like, it, I mean, it really is. Uh, Jim's up front saying, I told you. <laughs> I and he cuts um, a lot of classes. I, I totally get the reason why people would translate, the, you know, move around and go from campus to campus. I think in the modern era of our connectivity, you can get a lot of that by just traveling around and spending time in different institutions, not necessarily employed, but, you know, lecturing or meeting other colleagues and things like that. I've found that this building in particular has been an unbelievable accelerator for anything I've ever wanted to dream up. And the fact that I've had these family-like relationships with the leadership and with the community here have allowed me to, to be way more audacious than I think I would have been had I showed up uh, somewhere completely unannounced, right? So, so I mean, when I, when I say that, it, like, imagine talking to the director of this institute and saying you want to find the tomb of Genghis Khan and them saying, well, that sounds interesting and not kicking you out the door. I mean, that, like, 
like the fact that they didn't kick me out the door and they gave me a, a library card uh, was kind of what started it. Uh, and so I think it's less about, you know, moving around and making a bunch of networks all over the place. And it's, it, and it's more about um, surrounding yourself with audacious people and, and, and then building on those relationships uh, wherever they are. So. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, get it, I, I would say that he's wrong. I, I'd say that the modern, the modern world is one in which we're not so, like, geospatially located anymore, right? Yeah. I think uh, more audacious than we would have been is probably a great note to end on. Let's thank all of our speakers today, both from the first and the, the second panel. Let's go on. Is there anybody else who, who wanted to, to say? Oh, hey. Hey, Don. <laughs> <laughs> and now, one more thing.